Welcome to another episode of the Six P's podcast. Today is going to be a bit of a revision episode on Rewindow as we look at the characters. Just for a bit of an overview to start with, characters are obviously a great way into the themes and the ideas that are explored throughout the text. Something I will say is that characters shouldn't be an anchor, they should be used as evidence to support whatever, again, ideas or messages or values you think the film explores. Think about what the characters say about themselves as well as what they say about other people as well. We really want to make sure we're building a good, solid quotation bank. Consider what film techniques are used and what these convey or suggest about the characters. Again, that's a bit of that next level analysis. And consider these last two questions. Whether the characters change or whether they remain stagnant. I think that's a really good point and something for you to consider. Let's start with our protagonist, L.B. Jeffries, or Jeff as he's also known. It doesn't really matter what you refer to him as during your essays. I always think as long as you are consistent, uh, I introduce him as L.B. Jeff Jeffries and then just refer to him as Jeff or Jeffries thereafter. But again, as long as you're consistent. Now, he is a photographer who is confined to his wheelchair following uh, an accident. Um, a, car, a car accident, he was, photo, he was photographing some sort of car race and he hurt himself. The opening montage or the establishing sequence is really important in painting a picture of Jeffrey's life up until that point. Uh, we also find out, of course, that he was involved in World War II as a soldier with, um, or in the Air Force, I should say, um, with Detective Tom Doyle. He's quite fearful of marriage and the suffocating consequences of being committed to a marriage, and he lives vicariously. Essentially, that means he lives through other people. His beliefs and values are shaped by what he sees outside his window, and ultimately, he is, of course, punished for his behavior. There are sort of two storylines that track throughout the film. One, of course, is the murder mystery plot, but the other one is his relationship with Lisa, which is well worth exploring, and one that we'll touch on in a little bit more detail in a moment. But the other thing to consider is the fact that for the majority of the film, we as an audience are confined to his apartment, and we see pretty much everything that he sees, apart from a couple of things. Here are some key quotations. When he's on the phone to his um, editor, Gunnison, he says, six weeks sitting in a two-room apartment with nothing to do but look out the windows at the neighbours. Can't you see me? Rushing home to a hot apartment to listen to the automatic laundry, an electric dishwasher, and the garbage disposal, and the nagging wife. And this is overlaid by vision of Lars Thorwald uh, looking after his wife. And again, we get this idea that Jeffrey's views on marriage are shaped by what he sees, particularly the Thorwalds and the suffocating nature of marriage. And then his last, the last quotation I've got here is the fact that right now that he would welcome trouble. And eventually, that is what happens at the end of the film.
Let's talk about Lisa Fremont. Let's talk about Grace Kelly. Can you please be mindful of her, or the spelling of her last name? This is one of those last names that is continuously spelt wrong. Not that it's a massive deal, but I think it's important to get the characters' names right. She's definitely a modern woman. She's financially independent and she is sociable. She holds what seems to be a pretty good job in the fashion world. She desires marriage with Jeff and she makes that very well known throughout the film. In fact, she manages to assert herself over him throughout the film and overcomes not only the gender expectations of the time, but also Jeffrey's expectations. He suggests to her that he, she couldn't possibly fit into his world of adventure, but it is Lisa who is the courageous and adventurous one who ultimately ends up breaking into Thorwald's apartment. Some key quotations for Lisa, the fact that she's too perfect, she's too talented, she's too beautiful, and she's too sophisticated. This is Jeffrey's rationale behind not marrying her. And again, this is something that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. He actually calls her dinner later on quite perfect. Um, and I think it's quite quite apt. Jeffrey's also suggests that uh, to Lisa that she's got this town in the palm of her hand. And that is evident in terms of her work. And the last quotation comes from Stella. She says that Lisa Fremont is the right girl for any man with half a brain who can get one eye open. Clearly, and again this happens throughout the text, Jeffries and Lisa have differing opinions on their future and Lisa uses the murder mystery, I guess, to assert herself and to promote her desire for marriage. When it comes to how Lisa's character is presented, I think fashion is a great place to start. She, again, wears an $1,100 dress. Um, her clothing throughout the film tracks really well, though. Um, even at the end of the text, she is, of course, in this shot that we've got here on the left-hand side, we see her wearing a casual shirt, some loafers, and pants. You know, she's sort of wearing the pants. She's been the dominant and assertive one in the relationship, which sort of goes against... The expectations of the time but definitely look at, at the fashion that Lisa wears and even you know her handbags or her briefcases because these and her female intuition because that plays a big role um, in the murder mystery the camera angles are something else to look at too quite often Lisa is shown above Jeff to show her power at other times she's not so when they're having the conversation about their future we get the shot from over Jeff's back and we're looking sort of down on Lisa. But again, think about the camera angles. One symbol to think about is the wedding ring. That's Anna Thorwald's wedding ring, which Lisa is shown wearing. In fact, she points it out to Jeff, not only to showcase Lars Thorwald's guilt, um, but to promote her desire for marriage to Jeffries, which we see through that close up through the camera lens. Again, though, by the end of the film, we see Lisa has, and again, the ending of the film is open to interpretation. Some people suggest that she's reading the Harper's, as she's sorry, reading um, the adventure novel and she puts it away for uh, the Harper's Bazaar magazine. Some people, you know, analyze that as being, well, she's hiding her feminine side. That's what women have to do. They have to hide part of their lives in order to fit into a marriage. Other people say, no, she's being, you know, she's able to maintain her femininity. She's able to maintain her job and her relationship that for women after World War II, there isn't a need to sacrifice that aspect of their life, that they are, can happily balance both their working life and their domestic life as well. Again, the ending is up to interpretation. It's up to you. Just make sure whatever way you argue, that you've got evidence to support your claims. Let's now look at Stella, the insurance nurse, who, interestingly enough, initially slams Jeff for his preoccupation with voyeurism and staring at the, quote, bikini bombshells out the window, but eventually she becomes quite entangled in his theories. She's very quick to promote her own views on marriage and pushes Jeff to marry Lisa. She views marriage as being like two taxis on Broadway slamming into each other that you just get married and she points out her own marriage with Miles 
where they are two maladjusted misfits. The way she talks is interesting. She's quite direct and straight to the point. She's also quite graphic in the way that she talks about all kinds of things, including chopping up bodies, which I think is quite interesting. But um, again, um, at the end of the film, she doesn't want any part of it. <clears throat> Couple of quotes for Stella. The fact that she'll spread a little common sense on the bread. I like this idea. She's quite rational and logical, particularly at the start. And she references the legal, I guess, ramifications when it comes to worrism or being a peeping Tom, as she calls it. Uh, and the last quote, which I referenced slightly before. She says, when I married Miles, we were both a couple of maladjusted misfits. We are still maladjusted misfits and we have loved every minute of it. She really represents this traditional or old school view of marriage. Um, and she even chastises Jeff for, for modern marriage and, and intelligence and a range of other aspects that she thinks makes up marriage, which she views in the modern world as being far too complex, that marriage should be something that is quite simple. Let's look at uh, Lars Thorwald, our antagonist. He is a jewelry salesman. He looks after his invalid wife and eventually kills her. We see a couple of scenes with them together. He's sort of waiting hand and foot on her, you know, feeding her. Um, she's cooped up in bed. He even There's a nice little moment there where he um, brings in this dinner tray with a flower on it and she takes the flower out, throws it away and sort of laughs at him. She laughs at him a little bit later on as well when she catches him on the phone speaking to potentially another woman. He eventually confronts Jeffries and actually pushes him out the window, punishing him for his voracious tendencies, but ultimately is captured and confesses to the murder and to where his wife's body is in about 13 seconds. So he must be very quick in giving evidence. I think that's the timing of that last scene there between him letting go of Jeffries out the window and the policeman talking to him. Some quotes. Why would Thorwald want to kill a little dog? Because it knew too much. That's what Lisa believes. And again, Thorwald is, yeah, he does murder not only his, his wife, but he also murders the little dog who is that symbol of sort of innocence. When he enters Jeffrey's apartment, he asks, what do you want from me? Say something. Tell me what you want. A really interesting and important scene. He's obviously shot in the darkness here as well. And as he asks Jeffrey's that, as the audience, we too consider... Yeah, what is, what what do we want out of, out of this? Why are we watching, or why were we watching, his every move? The film technique to look at, and this shot highlights that is that breaking of the fourth wall. Not only is he staring directly at Jeffries, he is also staring directly at the audience again. The audience to consider or question the validity and the morality of uh, watching other people and voyeurism. Miss Lonely Hearts in the bottom apartment. She is single and what we would call a spinster. That is an older woman who is not married. Think about that as a label. She's desperate to find love. She's quite compassionate. We see that particularly when she places the dog carefully into the basket after his neck has been broken. And she is saved by the songwriter at the end when she attempts to commit suicide until hearing her music. Note that it is Stella that makes out that she's attempting to commit suicide through the tablets. Some key quotations. Speaking of misery, poor Miss Lonely Hearts, she drank herself to sleep again, alone. And then when she's in the songwriter's apartment, I can't tell you what this music has meant to me. We see her in this scene here uh, on an invisible date. She does show a bit of courage though. She does go out. With a bit of Dutch courage, she takes a bit of a drink and then goes out to the bar across the street to try and find someone. She also um, manages to push a man out the door when he makes advances on her. So she shows her strength there as well and it mimics that of Miss Torso in the apartment above who also has to push a man out um, when he makes those physical advances on her. Note to her name and... Um, these, this is a name given to her by, by Jeffries, Miss Lonely Hearts. He calls Thorwald the jewellery salesman. He calls the man the songwriter. Yet the women, he calls her Miss Lonely Hearts and he calls Miss Torso, Miss Torso. So note how women are viewed purely for their relationship status or their physical appearance, unlike the men who are labelled by their occupation. A film technique used throughout 
the film is a high camera angle, we are continuously looking down on Miss Lonely Hearts. We feel quite sorry for her throughout the film. You can also look at the green dress as a symbol of envy. Speaking of Miss Torso, let's talk about her. She is a dancer. She's viewed by Jeffries as flirtatious and promiscuous, and this is slightly different to the way that Lisa views her, and I think it's really cool how Jeffries views Lisa as much a lot like Miss Torso, yet Lisa views herself way more, or I guess um, sees herself more in Miss Lonely Hearts' character. Interestingly enough, Miss Torso is, is pictured with men in, in, in her apartment, um, but her partner actually returns home at the end of the film and he's sort of not what we expect. He's a short man with glasses who's quite portly. Definitely not what we we're expecting, but she's so excited to see Stanley at the end of the film and he's quite hungry and they go straight to the fridge. She's actually pictured quite a lot going to the fridge, um, which is interesting. Looking at these quotes, Jeffries mentions that, you know, she sure is the eat, drink and be merry girl. He also says she's like the queen bee with her pick of the drone. She's sort of got three men in her apartment at one time entertaining them. She's doing a woman's hardest job, juggling wolves, as Lisa says, and Jeffrey's notes that she picks the most prosperous one. But Lisa mentions that she's not in love with any of them and that Lisa can see that herself. This is a nice shot of Miss Torso. This is one of the few shots from outside of Jeffrey's apartment. Uh, we're looking up at her. And we see the compassion and sympathy that, that she feels for her neighbours, much like Miss Lonely Hearts. So while these characters are sort of, I guess, judged by Jeffries quite harshly, we see them in quite a positive light in this that particular scene anyway. The last character we're going to look at in depth is the songwriter, who is sometimes referred to as the composer. It's up to you what you sort of want to refer to him as. He is continuously frustrated trying to finish this piece of writing. He also appears to be quite isolated, but eventually he does finish his piece of music, which is entitled Lisa and plays over the concluding sequence. The quotation, and again, this is Jeffrey's living vicariously. He says that he lives alone and that he probably had an unhappy marriage. That's why he's so frustrated. It was the marriage that made him frustrated. The symbol I've got here is a window bar. This is actually just cropped out, unfortunately, but this scene sort of shows how imprisoned he is and how isolated he is through the bars. To the left and to the right of him in those frames, we see couples as well. So it's just that symbol of, of isolation that I really like and one of those next level pieces of analysis that, that you can look at. What's interesting to note is in the concluding sequence that he and Miss Lonely Hearts are in different frames as well, and potentially we might be able to see that maybe this won't be a fairy tale ending for these characters, but again, um, it's up to you how you want to analyze that. So what other characters could you look at? Well, Detective Tom Doyle is definitely one you can do so. He represents the law. Him and Jeff have a bit of a tense relationship, but one that is quite strong based on uh, events that happened uh, during the war. You could also look at the newlyweds who live the apartment just next to Jeff. We see uh, them track throughout the film, you know, the initial bliss of being married, but eventually the frustration that comes from that and that closing scene when the when the um, wife sort of says, if I had known you had to quit your job, I would never have married you. I also like the fact that he finds the marriage so suffocating has to sort of open up the window to sort of escape it. It's that nice bit of symbolism. The couple with the dog are also interesting to look at. Note how they are happy to sleep on the balcony outside. They're quite open. There's no real privacy with them. You've got, uh, well, she's sometimes labeled as Miss Hearing Aid, but the woman with the hearing aid who Thorwald tells to shut up. She's also a sculptor, so you might want to call her the sculptor as well, but it doesn't really fit in well with that idea of the men are called or labelled by their occupations and the women by their physical or relationship status. We've got the nuclear family up the top, the father, the mother, and the two kids who we only brush over from time to time. Again, that doesn't elicit any excitement from Jeffries, which is perhaps why they're never really focused on, but we do see them from time to time as the camera pans across 
the neighborhood. And the last one is a character who we only hear of. It's Gunnison, Jeff's editor, who speaks with him at the start of the film. There's, again, that's a really important conversation because we learn a little bit about Jeff and his job throughout that conversation. So what are some key takeouts from today? Well, my first piece of advice is to undertake further research on each of these characters and build really strong profiles on all of them, not just the protagonists, but also those secondary characters. We're looking for, yes, good discussion on, on the key characters, but also bits and pieces on those secondary characters. I definitely encourage you to create a quotation bank for each character and connect these to the key themes and ideas. So some themes that are often looked at are voyeurism, gender roles, community, isolation, um, ethics, morality. All these are really good things to look at. And you connect, you know, marriage, relationships. You can sort of connect all these to the characters. I'd like you to also consider film techniques and what these suggest about each character and what they value. This is that next level analysis that you can provide to show to the examiner you're not just thinking about what is being said in the film but how the film is made and what that suggests or what Hitchcock is trying to promote, that authorial intent. So is Hitchcock trying to promote traditional marriage values? Is he trying to condemn traditional gender roles? Is he trying to challenge, confront you know, all these things that Hitchcock is trying to do, we want to use the film techniques as evidence to showcase that. But that's a quick snapshot of the characters. Again, go out and do your own research. But thanks for your company once again on the Six Piece Podcast. Look forward to seeing you for another revision episode very soon.